what are you going to tell yourself? Are you going to tell yourself, you know what? Whatever happened, happened for a reason. Learn the lessons from it. And what's your best move going forward? Like, do you want to be a happy, loving, kind person where, you know, you can make a, a change? Can you, And now that you've experienced this, you can help others that have gone through this as well. Like now that now you are a gift, you are a gift to that person that who is suffering to, to help them get over it and to move on. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Food Matters podcast, your home for nutrition, health and wellness education. My name is Laurentine. I am a filmmaker and a nutritionist and the founder of foodmatters.com. And I'm here to hold your hand on this journey to optimum health, transformation, and emotional healing. Hello, hello, Food Matters family, and welcome to the Food Matters podcast. I am joined today with a really good friend of mine and yoga teacher, Kat Finnerty, and she's joining me live from Vanuatu. Hi, Kat. Hi, Laurentine. Hello. Wish you were here. So, I know. So, Kat is um, here talking to us today um, about difficult times in our lives, and her personal story has led a, ha- led her on a journey. And she liked to call herself the master of disaster because she has had and gone through some pretty adverse conditions and scenarios and sequences in her life that has have allowed her to upgrade her her level of thinking to now she actually enjoys disasters <laughs> she knows how to handle them because she's been through so many <laughs> so Kat tell us a little bit about your life and how did the, all this start for you like tell us about your first adversity that you had to go through in your life well That probably goes way, way back. So um, when I was actually six years old, I started getting migraines. And my migraines were brought on basically by often the foods I ate, but also by emotions. So things like uh, taco seasoning would give me like intense migraines. I'd be hospitalized because of the pain. I'd pass out from the pain. And so my mom was really into alternative medicine, and she thought she'd she tried to find a way. So they did. we did identify there was lots of foods that, that caused it and also emotions. So things that made me like really, really, really happy and things that made me really, really, really sad caused a migraine for me. So I spent a lot of years just not eating red food dye, like old El Paso with like instant migraine, mm. that taco seasoning just got me every time. So I, I learned from like a really young age that what I ate could definitely and how I thought could it impact how I actually felt. So that was probably my my first real disaster because anytime anything good was happening, I'd basically end up with a migraine and be quite sick with it. Wow. Um, so, so yeah, that was probably... Of, which types of foods did you say that were causing these migraines? Uh, so when I was younger, it was definitely chocolate would cause migraines. So Easter was always like happy, sad, pain, ple- pleasure, pain. It was like chocolate. Oh, no. Um, mm. old, old, old El Paso, you know, the taco seasoning, whatever spice they put in that. Yes. Kentucky Fried Chicken was like instant migraine. We used to also, um, in uh, grade school, we used to get these tablets when the dentist came around that was like red food dye to show if you didn't brush your teeth properly. And that, whatever that dye was, was like instant migraine. So yeah, cheese used to give me an instant migraine. Certain things would really trigger it. So I learned from a really young age that food was so, so powerful. So later on in my life, when I was faced with, you know, basically a life of perhaps being in a wheelchair, the idea of eating food and how food could actually contribute to my health or my deterioration really impacted me. So that's where my my love and my 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 desire and my knowledge of how food and how thinking. And when I used to have my migraines, it would used to be excruciating pain, but I worked out if I could just go and lie down in a quiet room, they would go away. So I just had to like focus on my breath and then almost, I didn't know it then, but I was like meditating and then the pain would just go away. And then as soon as I started thinking about it again, it would just like explode. So that was probably wow. my first big disasters for about 10 years. Wow. 
And then um, you were telling me a story about what happened when you were in the hospital as well. And you had disaster after disaster. Tell me about that. Well, I've had many um, hospital um, issues, but um, yeah, I guess the first one was I am. Um, I would decide to do a stem cell transplant. So when I was 25, I was diagnosed with MS and I was told I'd be in a wheelchair by the time I was 40. So I was like, yeah, no way, no way am I going to be like that. So I really put together a plan to get over it. So I, first of all, I, t I tackled food and I was really, really strict. It was like, if I couldn't, if it wasn't on the diet, I just wouldn't put it in my mouth. But despite mm -hmm. that, um, I think part of the problem was they told me not to have any children. And I ended up having three kids in three years, which were, yeah, <laughs> probably not the best idea. <laughs> but I really, and, and the drugs they gave us, they, they gave us these injections that, you know, every second day you had to inject yourself and they were painful and they were ineffective. So I really tried to find a different way. So one time I, I was in Canada and a friend of mine, had also had MS and she was part of one of the first people to have a stem cell transplant in Israel. So I thought, oh, I'm going to try that. So I actually went to Israel and met these doctors. And at the time it was $40,000 and they were able to take stem cells out of me, but they couldn't put them back into me. So then they sent me to Greece, to Athens, to have these stem cells that they took out of my hip in Israel put back in Greece. So when I got to Greece... Wow. I was there and it was my 35th birthday actually. And I got to the hospital and I was like, Oh God, like they smoke in the corridors and it's, it's, it's not a great situation. And, um, so it was my 35th birthday and my friend was holding my hand as they, they, the neat doctor came in and she was stabbing me with this needle in my back to try to gain entry to my spinal cord for a spinal tap. And the idea was they were going to take out some of my spinal fluid and replace it with these stem cells that they'd taken out of my body in Israel. But what happened was like the third or fourth time she stabbed me in my back, she hit something and I just heard it and I felt something just go snap. And I was like, she's just hit something. And this, this doctor, she's Greek. She didn't speak English and she was kind of a little bit cranky. She wasn't, I think, happy about the situation she was put in. So anyway, they put these cells into me and then I had to lie on my back for four hours and then I was meant to be able to go home. And I had this big uh, birthday plan for myself in Athens and then, yeah, it didn't go well. So I spent about the next five days in hospital with a major brain hemorrhage. So, yeah, that was one of my um, my hospital times. And um, during the whole time, it was funny, there was, there was another girl who was um, in the bed next to me who was going through the same thing. So something went wrong with the procedure. We both went through this. And, um, you know, I just kept saying to myself, it's, it's like this new, now, this too shall pass. And what's the best thing for you to do? And it wasn't to freak out. It was just to just remain calm. It's like, there's nothing mm -hmm. I can do right now. Like right now my head's exploding. And then um, after the fifth day, the, the nurses were like, you have to leave now because we were only meant to be there for 24 hours. And then when they went to sit me up, I could no longer bend. I'd lost the ability to bend. So obviously when the doctor was um, trying to get into my spinal cord, she hit a nerve and I, I lost my ability to bend for over a month. So yeah. So then I had to sort of fight my way back from that and use acupuncture and movement and you know, and, and most doctors said to me, I was crazy. Like, what were you thinking doing what you did? You should never have been there. Wow. And, and tell us about the later, your health journey with recovering from MS. So, yeah, so the stem cell transplant I had was when I was 35. And, you know, my neurologist at the time said, oh, you're crazy. Why would you go and do something like this? Well, the stem cell transplant actually bought me five years of great health and, and I was pretty good. But I, when I was 40, I was, um, I was part of a trial. So because I'd had MS since I was 25, I was always looking at different ways to cure myself in natural ways rather than using drugs because I only used drugs for maybe the first five years. So when I was 40, I was part of a trial. It was a two-year trial at the Alfred Hospital, and they would send a tube up through your groin and into your neck. And they thought MS had something to do with the blood flow between your brain and your, the rest of your body. 
So they were stenting the veins in my neck. So while I was in there for my 40th birthday, I was lying there and my daughter, I had three kids. My youngest, my daughter rang me and she said, oh, mommy, guess what? And I said, what, honey? She goes, well, happy birthday. And oh, by the way, Tanya slept in your bed last night. I was like, oh, really? So um, I, I quickly I went in, they did the procedure on me and um, I got in my car and I drove home and I found out that yes, indeed, my my husband was sleeping with our friend and I was completely and utterly devastated. I thought, oh my God, how, what am I going to do now? Like, this was my life. I thought I would be married forever. And then all of a sudden my husband's like, sorry, I'm leaving you. It's over. Goodbye. And I spent that night thinking I should probably just drink a few bottles of wine and forget about this. But then I thought that's probably a bad idea. <laughs> so instead I, I, I lay in bed oh. and I meditated I meditated on all of my past disasters and everything that happened in my life. And by the time the morning came around, I was like, you know what? I've been through so many awful things in my life. I'm lying in a comfortable bed. I have wine in my cupboard. I've got chocolate. I've got food. You know, my husband left me. It doesn't have to be a horrible thing. If I thought it was a horrible thing, it would be a horrible thing. And it started off as like the most devastating thing. I thought, who am I going to be now? Like, what's going to happen? But by the time the morning came around, I thought, you know what? This could either be terrible or it could be a good thing. And it just depends on how I think about it. And it's nothing's good, nothing's bad, but thinking makes it so. And that's from Shakespeare said that many years ago. So I decided to make it a positive thing, a good thing. Wow, that is so interesting that how we can, we can actually talk ourselves into suffering. We can talk ourselves into fear. We can talk ourselves into illness. You know, our brain, our mental capacity is so powerful and how we rephrase things and how we use our language to affirm or to to downgrade what we're going through is so important and that that's really inspiring and so tell us about the book that you're writing because this is obviously a topic you're very passionate about so yeah so when my husband when, when I found out about my husband and and when I had this miraculous 12 hours of realizations like I had 12 realizations over those 12 hours that basically really helped me to get past it so over the night of course like I'd get really, really upset. And then I'd counteract it with a, a disaster from my past. And I had like these 12 realizations over my time. Like I used to be in the army and it was like pain is a uh, strength is built on pain, you know, and uh, I studied Buddhism for 12 years. And it was like the idea of, uh, you know, impermanence, like nothing lasts forever, you know, and eventually things get easier. So as I when I woke up the next day, and I started telling people like, Oh, guess what my, um, husband left me yesterday and you know I lived in a tiny town of 800 people everybody knew everyone so you know they probably knew about the affair before I did but I was like and, and people had looked at me and they thought I was absolutely crazy you know because I was like you know I, I welcomed Tanya into our home and um we did family things together and it was just really seamless and easy. And I decided I was going to write a book called how to get over betrayal in 12 hours, because so many people you speak to, you know, someone leaves them or someone cheats on them and they're, they're devastated and they're upset for so long. And most people, you know, you, you talk to them five, 10 years down the track, they're like, Oh God, it was such a good thing, but it can take them so many years to get over it. Mm. So I decided I could suffer for 12 hours 12 days, 12 years, or a lifetime, and I chose 12 hours. And this is why I've written a book, to try to help people go, you know what, I don't need to keep suffering. I have a choice. I have a choice how long I stay angry and upset and suffer for these things. Wow. Oh, I'm going to be a bit of a devil's advocate here. I'm sure the viewers are going to say, but, you know, what about the fact that, you know, if somebody hurts you, you sort of need to feel that, you know, you need to sit with that pain and you know, you need to, to actually, you know, acknowledge that and grieve. Yeah. You know, when I told people I was writing a book, How to Get Over Betrayal in 12 Hours, a lot of people said, well, that's just ridiculous. And a lot of people told me, like, what about your grieving period? And I said, they said, they said you have to grieve. And I said, okay, well, so how long do you have to grieve for? 
I said, isn't grieving length of grieving a choice as well? And what's really interesting in Vanuatu is when people die, they have a hundred day ceremony. So basically they, they, they grieve for a hundred days and then it's done. So mm. I'm not saying that I was over and done with and everything was perfect. We, I certainly did have ups and downs, but having studied meditation and Buddhism for 12 years, I used to meditate and think, oh God, why, um, why, why would you meditate and sit there and think about nothing? It was so boring. So what I learned about meditation is that while it's really, really boring, it's actually just practicing for the times when things get really challenging. So I use my meditation wow. over the night to really focus on just every time a horrible thought came into my mind, I just pushed it away. I was like a leopard ready ready to pounce. Every time something came up, it was like I combated it with the gratitude, with my thankfulness, with everything that was going right in my life. Wow. Okay, so when I'm just imagining here when like, you know, fear would come up in regards to feeling the loss or how am I going to be financially or how am I going to have a career or without this person and having all this energy inside your body, what would you what would you say to yourself like give me some mantras so over the night basically I, I i focus on these 12 steps so you know pain strength is built on pain so it's like everyone goes through that challenging times i also reflected back on my grandmother so my grandmother and, and gratitude so my grandmother was um she was from zavlin in the czech republic and she went through the holocaust so in a town of sixty thousand people or sorry, 80,000 people, 60,000 Jews were murdered. So I really focused on, wow, you know, is this really that bad? Like, yes, my husband leaving me and end of my marriage was, a, you know, not something I wanted to happen, but it happened. And it was like, what can I be grateful for? I also focused and remembered about um, my mother. She passed away on my 12th birthday, and that was really challenging. Uh, I was the eldest of five children. And my dad said that everything in life is impermanent. We will lose absolutely everything that we have one day. So then I reflected on my relationship with my, with my husband. I thought, well, one day either he would leave, I would leave, one of us would die. The relationship was always impermanent. So can I just be grateful for what's happened? And another thing is karma. You know, um, what was my responsibility? What did I do in the relationship? that caused him to want to leave me or gave him that, that thought. And it was like, I had to take responsibility for my actions in the relationship. Wow. So you're a yoga teacher now. And I remember in a lot of your classes, when I used to do your classes, you would always remind us, you know, to push further and deep, dig deeper and stay in the pose, even though it's hurting, you know, we're, we're just practicing for life, right? So how do you, how does this philosophy translate? And can you explain a little bit more to our listeners? So with, when I was diag with, diagnosed with MS, I was, I was always a, a runner. I was always a marathon runner. I taught fitness, I've taught aerobics. And then, you know, being diagnosed with MS and then eventually being able to barely able to walk. So I could only walk for maybe a hundred meters. And I had three kids in three years, which was, you know, really hard on my body. And by the time I had my third child, I could hardly walk, but at least she was in a pusher because I could actually use that as a walking stick. And I was really strong in my mind. I always thought, I'm, I don't want anyone telling me what I, what I can't do. I never listened to, um, I never listened to what I read stories about MS or what could happen to me. I thought if it's happening to me, it's happening to me. So I just kept going, okay, I can't, something's hard, but I'm just going to keep going and keep going and keep going. And especially with yoga. So I spent many years not being able to, to lift my left leg. So I didn't lift for about 10 years. And so I'd go to my yoga classes and teach yoga and I'd stand, always stand next to a wall and hang on to a wall. And I thought, I never thought, well, I can't do it. I thought I can't do it yet. And so I'd sat there and I didn't try once or twice or a hundred times or a thousand times. I probably tried a million times to lift my leg up. And then after about a million times, I'm now starting to do things that I haven't, hadn't been able to do for many, many, many years. So I keep thinking to myself, I'm either getting stronger or I'm getting weaker. And every single moment I have a choice 
to get stronger or to get weaker. So what's the best thing for me to do in this moment? And it's the same with my thoughts. Whenever I start to feel tired or angry or frustrated, I think it's like this right now. There's a reason why why it's like this right now. But what's the best way for me to respond for my present happiness and my future happiness? So from moment to moment, it's like, you know, I could go, yeah, I can't be bothered or I'm angry or frustrated and, you know, and I can stay in that space or I can talk to myself and say, hey, what's going on? What, how else can you think about it? And I think our lowest times are really, really important because they're the catalyst for change. And unless we actually get down into that place where, you know, it, things are not comfortable anymore. Our comfort zone is a nice place to live, but there's no growth there. So I always find when, I, when I'm in my comfort zone, it's like I almost need something to push me out of it. And that's why I love my disasters <laughs> because yeah. often it's the disasters that cause you to change and, and give you that catalyst for change. And then you're always stronger eventually because of them if you choose to learn the lessons from them. I mean, none of, the, none of us want disease. None of us want our loved ones to die. But if we can learn from the lessons, if we can go, how would I want if I was, you know, if I was to die, do I want my kids grieving endlessly for me or do I want them to know that I'm smiling down on them going, go, babe, go, you know, have a great life. I'm here. I'm here cheering you on and I don't want them to be sad. And I don't, you know, so I think I don't have to grieve the end of people's lives. I don't have to grieve the end of relationships. I can take the good from them and learn from from mistakes I made or from that relationships and know that every relationship is impermanent. Wow. It's so beautiful and humbling to hear that. And it's such a new way of looking at it because in our, I guess our social media and on TV and all the different sitcoms, we've always been taught, you know, if your husband cheats on you or if, if X, Y, Z happens, then you need to retaliate or you need to, you know, take him to court or, you know, take half and, and make a big deal out of it. You know, whereas, it's sort of like this this mantra what you have is like what would love do or how can we actually be in a peaceful way with our family with ourselves and we don't necessarily need to beat ourselves up or the other person up for something that has just happened and and we actually can and make peace with it in an overall situation in an overall like overall perspective um how in regards to your buddhist philosophy can i learn more about your your teacher your buddhist teacher and where you first started learning all these these really beautiful life skills that we can all perhaps learn from you well the reason i started to study buddhism was because when i was my third daughter when my youngest child was about two years old i really got severely depressed and it was to a point where every tree I saw I wanted to drive drive into it like I couldn't barely walk anymore I had three young kids I lived in a tiny town in the middle of nowhere I'm Canadian but I was living in Australia and you know I missed my family in Canada and I just everything I loved like I I was a physical person I like to walk and I like to run and I I, yeah my career everything I did and Mm -hmm. I was severely depressed and and, and they say MS does affect your mind so I thought I either have to move to India and learn Buddhism or I'm going to kill myself so funnily enough I, I went to Melbourne and I went to see a massage therapist one day and I told her I was leaving my family and I was going to move to India and find Buddhism and at the time, my husband said, look, whatever you have to do, you need to do it because you're no good here right now. And the massage therapist said, well, you, they teach Buddhism upstairs, so you might not have to go to India. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's perfect. I live four hours away from Melbourne. And so I joined the class. And every single Wednesday for a year, I drove eight hours return trip to Melbourne. And that's where I started my Buddhism. And it was really fierce. So funnily enough, my very first day, they said, you're suffering because of your perception of your life. And I said, yeah, my life sucks. Like I can hardly walk. I have three young children and um, I was I had lost the vision in my eye and I was living in the middle of nowhere and I was unhappy in my marriage. And I really, I didn't see a way out. You know, I was told I'd be in a wheelchair by the time I was 40 and I just saw the end of my life. So the uh, my Buddhist teacher said, you think your life sucks? Well, you just t- change your perception of it. And I'm like, really? And she's like, yeah. So what I want you to do, here's your homework. You go home 
and you think of something you hate and you keep uh, experience, experiencing it until you love it. So my thing was Vegemite. I hated Vegemite. And I thought, well, if I can love Vegemite, I can probably love just about anything. So I got home and I thought, and I was, I was already starting like from my very first class, my Buddhist teacher said, all of our happiness comes from our desire to bring happiness to others. And all of our pain comes from our selfish desire to bring only happiness to ourselves. So I knew then that I was too focused on myself. And they also say in Buddhism that, and this is my interpretation of Buddhism, but they also say that depression is um, selfishness turned inward. So it's like if all you're thinking about is yourself and what you haven't got, then then depression is like karma and it comes back and it says, if you only want to think about yourself, here you go. Think about yourself 24 hours a day and see how that feels. And it sucks and it causes depression. So... I went home with this idea that, first of all, I'm going to try to love Vegemite. And second of all, I'm going to stop worrying about myself all the time and think, how would my kids feel with a mother like me? How would my husband feel with a wife like me? And how can I think about them more than thinking about what I haven't got all the time? And from that moment on, it's not that I became some kind of a saint or an enlightened being, for sure, I'm not. But I started practicing that when I felt depressed, it's because you know what? You're thinking about yourself all the time again. Start thinking about someone else's happiness. What can you do to make someone else happy? And by doing that and by, you know, by making that effort to bring joy and happiness to others, in turn came back to me. So it's the karma. It's the idea of what you give, you get back. And so I spent a week trying to love Vegemite. And even though after the week, I didn't love it, I came back to my class the next week going, right, if I I don't mind Vegemite before I hated it. Now I'm like at the point where I'm like, yeah, it's okay. But my goal was to get Vegemite to be my hangover food. (laughs) And it wasn't quite hangover food yet, but I was getting there. So yeah, so that was the two biggest first lessons from Buddhism was to stop thinking about myself all the time and bring happiness to others and to change my perception. And I I don't have to perceive my life. I, right now I can walk. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. I only have to worry about right now. And what's my best decision? It's not to wallow in grief and anger and frustration. It's like what what's happening that's what's going right for you right now that you can be happy about. You know, you've got a bed, you've got a car, you've got so much. You've got access to the best health care in the world. There is so much to be grateful for. And once I learned to flip my perspective on everything, my life completely changed. Wow. And that's how I got over my husband leaving me. (laughs) Mm, It's beautiful. What a story. And it's also interesting because, I mean, also in the Buddhist teachings and the Vedic teachings and the philosophies of the Bhagavad Gita, it talks about non-attachment, right? We're so attached to the outcome. Like we're so attached to that relationship working out and like that person is my only source of happiness and, you know, or or that house, that is my only source of income, um, my only source of of, of happiness. And if my income is taken away from me and I have to leave that house, then I will be depressed. And, you know, we have this attachment um, to things, people, places. And and really, if you, you read the, the Vedic philosophy and you read the Buddhist teachings, it talks about non-attachment. So allowing ourselves to be happy despite having less or despite not having that that object of of affection and can you tell us a little bit more about how this has this impacted your life yeah so attachment is you know one of the biggest reasons our ignorance our attachments and our our ignorance attachment and aversion is one of the reasons that we really suffer which Buddha explained, but for me, how I interpret it, and I, I've studied Buddhism for 12 years, but I'm someone that takes little bits and pieces of what really resonates with me. And as far as attachment, you know, our Buddhist teacher used to say, you don't remember the first breath you take, and you don't know when you'll take your last. And when you take your last breath, you take nothing with you when you die. And so it's like everything you have, you'll lose. So it's, you know, and I, I love that idea. It's like when I lose an earring, it's like, of course, it's OK, because I was always going to lose it. So it's mm-hmm. when we become over ignorantly attached to thinking and something that's not going to last forever, an impermanent thing is going to last forever. When we become overly attached to that, then we suffer. 
But if we realize that that thing is impermanent, we're always going to lose it, then we can go, okay, with wisdom, look at the fact that this is over, but it was always at one point going to change. Like nothing stays the same, minute to minute, second to second, one breath to the next. Life is never the same. Like look at COVID, you know, it just it just changed everyone's lives. And, and that's what it's like. It's like every moment something changes. Every moment someone, you know, you look at the numbers like COVID going up, but that's change. We're constantly in, 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 in change. And people are always constantly surprised. Like, oh my God, like it's, it's changed. But of course it so did. It was true. always going to change. Yeah, that's so true. And, and it's true. It's like living when we were going through COVID. I mean, we were there together in Vanuatu. We didn't know when it was going to end. We didn't know. And it was all of a sudden that we started to live for the day, right? Because we didn't know what was going to happen in the future. We didn't know if we were going to be able to leave the country. And we decided, you know what, let's make our happiness here today. Let's make let's make an effort and go to a yoga class. Let's make an effort with our kids and have a great time. Let's make a beautiful meal. You know, it's actually what COVID did for us and a lot of people that were stuck in either their homes or their country is it allowed them to start thinking about the things that they do really love, they really enjoy doing. You know, a lot of people started passion projects. A lot of people started following their hearts. A lot of people realized that they needed to make ends meet with with the bills they needed to pay and started to, you know, make pastries or cooking on the side while actually doing something they love, you know. So it, it really allowed a lot of us to to be more present, right, and not have so much attachment to the future and not have so much attachment to the outcome and and knowing where we're going. And um, and how? Tell me a little bit more about how you live your life because it's so interesting. Like you you saying you don't really know what's going to happen tomorrow, so you you really just appreciate your bed and you appreciate where you are right now. I mean, don't you have to think? I mean, we were always told you got to think about the future. You got to you know make sure your your kids have an education and college and they can pay for you can pay for it. So how how does how does that philosophy translate into into real life? I find that, um, and I used to be someone too that was like, you know, I had to make so much money and I had to do so much work every day so I could earn so much. And I was really, really driven. And, you know, I was I was reading Anthony Robbins' Awaken the Giant Within when I was 18 years old and running big sales teams, you know, in my early 20s. And I was really driven and about success and that really defined who I was. And that's what I thought defined me. But as I've moved on, I realize, you know, the times I, I was number one at, you know, in different sales organizations I was in, the times I had the most accolades, it was the times I was actually felt almost the worst. Like it didn't bring me any joy because I thought when I get to this point, then I'll be happy, but I wasn't. And there were often the times I just didn't feel, and, and, and what it was is, I think one of the Buddhist principles, joyful effort. If there's something to do, do it and do it joyfully and it, because it's there to be done and not attached to the outcome. So when I was like always like outcome driven, I was like really attached to like, I've got to get here and then I'll be happy. Then I, when I didn't achieve it, I was like, Ugh, you know, and always trying to strive for more. And it was like, but that was just causing me more suffering. So I thought, no, you know what? I'm going to do what I have to do joyfully and happily and work really hard at it but I'm not going to attach to the result because if I was always going, well, I'm going to do this work. Oh, uh, for example, I was, I made, I don't know, this is a silly example, but I remember I was at my sister's house in Canada one year and she was complaining how, you know, she, she was working full time and had no time to clean. And I snuck upstairs, you know, when she was making food for the whole family was there and I cleaned the house for like three hours upstairs. I did her laundry and I scrubbed the bathrooms and, you know, and she came up and she was so angry at me. You know, she's like, how dare you clean the bathroom? I didn't ask you to do that. And I was like, <laughs> but had I, had I been attached to the result of her going, thank you so much. Oh my God. I wasn't, I was there to do it joyfully and yet yeah, stung a little bit, but then I was like, no, I did it joy. You know, I was doing a kindness. So if you're doing something out of kindness and a love with the right intention, it's never the wrong thing. So it's like, mm -hmm. what can I do every day to bring a little bit of joy and kindness for the sake of doing it, not for wanting anything in return, right. but just for the sake exactly. of doing it because it's there to be done. Because so many exactly. times we'll go, oh, I have to do canteen again, or, you know, I've got to do this. It's like, actually, you don't have to do any of it. 
everything's a choice. Mm -hmm. People say, oh, but I've got to cook dinner for my kids. I'm like, no, you don't. Your kids will actually survive. Like, you know, I, mm. I had a situation where my mother died on my birthday, leaving my father with five young children. We were 12, 10, 8, 6, and 3. And my dad was not a hands-on father. And all of a sudden, he had to look after these five kids, and he just did it. So when people say, you know, I have to drive my kids here, or I have to cook there, or I have to go to work, I'm like, no, you don't. You actually don't have to do any of those things. Every single thing you do is a choice. So you can choose to cook dinner, you can choose to go to work, and you can choose to do that happily and joyfully. Mm. And then that's, a, it's just a choice how you think about it. Oh, I get to go to work, you know, oh, you got a job. And that's what my Buddhist teacher used to say, like, oh, you know, you're not happy in your life, but you've got a car. I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, you know, I drove from my house. She said, you have a house? Do you know how lucky you are to have a house? Oh, you've, do you have running water and toilets in your house? I'm like, yes. And so it's like, constantly dialing it back going okay I'm grateful for this and I'm happy and what else do I really need it's like always do I need everything can I just be content with what I've got right here and now and that is happiness going you know what right now there's nothing else I need I've got everything I need and then you're happy when you stop constantly craving and wanting things or not wanting things but it's a journey and I haven't perfected it yet <laughs> Do your health goals seem out of reach? I completely know the feeling, because my family has been there. For us, it all began with a film, one that Laurentine and I were inspired to make to help my father heal from chronic fatigue syndrome and support his body naturally. And you know what? It worked. He went from being on a cocktail of six different medications a day to living a happy, healthy, and pain-free life using natural foods and holistic remedies in less than three months. That's when we knew that this information had to be shared with the world. And this became our very first film, Food Matters, which we released in 2008. Since that film came out, we've gone on to produce Hungry for Change and Transcendence Season 1 and 2. From debunking diet culture to healing from limiting beliefs and childhood trauma, our films have changed countless lives around the world and were, were created to make a lasting difference in your life. Because there's no greater asset than your health, and it's critical that we take care of our bodies. And really, as David Wolf says, the best doctor in the world, the best nutritionist in the world is you. Nobody is more suitably qualified to look after yourself than you. And it's never too late to transform your health and life. With the power of education, we have the capability to achieve anything. If you're interested in seeing our films and taking the next step on your education and healing journey, head to foodmatters.com forward slash films. I cannot wait for you to see them. You're doing amazing at it. I love that that reframing, right? It's like finding happiness in little moments and and reframing our mind to think, yes, we get to do that. We get to make dinner for our family. We get to make make lunches for our kids in the morning. And, you know, some people may not even have kids and, and some people may not even be able to make enough food make enough money to pay for food for lunches. So it is, it's a reframing. And how how in regards to um, starting all over again and restarting a new identity for those perhaps women and men that are listening out there right now and, and thinking about, geez, you know, perhaps I went through a pretty terminal illness and I got out of there or I, I made it out and, for example, uh, had a, a massive breakup and it destroyed me and, and now I have to reinvent myself. Could you shine some more light on, on how to do that? Yeah, it's, I think that comes back to attachment as well. So we're really attached. I'm a wife. I'm a mother. I'm a you know, CEO. I've got a business. You know, we're really attached to the idea that this is who we are and this is what defines us. And so mm. I find when we let go of that idea that we are just, that you can't even say your name. Like you're just an identity. You're a creation of your, your ego. So we create this idea of who we are we think we should be and it's like and we think that should not change but it's like it was going to change like your kids are not always going to need you they're going to grow up you know you're going to you are going to one day probably be unemployed finish your job or retire not be the best and it's like and it's like going 
you know, given that it's like this now, like this has happened, this is change has happened. My husband's left me. It's like, yes, you can be angry and cranky and you can see your, you know, your kids go through this watching you guys fight you can see all this family disintegrate because the two of you are just like at each other's throats all the time or you can go you know what I played a part they played a part you know what why don't we just be kind and loving to each other and what's going to be in my best future outcome in in the long run is it to be angry and frustrated and fight them in court or is it to go you know what uh, I love you. I forgive you. I love me. I forgive me. And what's the best way to move forward? And if people just stop a good divorce, they say, and I love this bit of advice, a good divorce is when two people are equally unhappy with the result. So it's like, you're never going to get everything that we want. But if you can just be content with what's happened, because if you're getting more, someone's getting less. So where can you switch that around? And can you wish happiness for your person? So when my ex-husband, when, when I went through with what I was going through, all night I just went, send him love, send him love, send her love, wish them happiness. Like I just, I really was wow. like, I'm sending them love and happiness and I hope they have a nice life together because the only way for me to ever be happy is to wish happiness on another person. And especially, oh. and it doesn't really work for the nice person that gives you coffee every day, you know, or the people that are really sweet and kind to you. The people you need to really work on are the people that you just really push every single one of your buttons. And then you say, you know what? I wish you love. I wish you happiness. And though that's when you get the extra karmic points. And that's when it comes back to you. When you go, you know what? You've hurt me. I can forgive you. I love you. I let it go. And then you'll start to see. see and, and just try it. Like I always say to people, just try it. Those per So I started a thing. Um. Actually, it was funny and it wasn't, it was just a bit of a joke, but when my, um, my ex-husband and his partner, new partner have just had their fourth child so that he's now got seven children. So when they have, when I was in Australia, when they had their first two kids and I'd bake them a cake when they had a baby. And I, I started this thing on Facebook called hashtag bake a cake for someone you hate. And I thought it was like really great. I mean, I didn't hate them, but you know, I didn't really want them to have more children because I thought maybe three might be enough and, and four and, you know, seven's, you know, perhaps excessive, but there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> so given there's nothing I can do about it, why can't I just, I have a choice. I can be angry and say to my children, oh, look at your father having all these children. He's got no time for you, you know, blah, 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 whatever, you know, create this whole story around it. Or I can go, there's nothing I can do about it. So I'm just going to be happy for you and I'm going to bake you a cake. And I baked a really good cake. Like it was almonds and dark chocolate. It was really healthy, but yummy. And it was like a really good cake. And I would say the more expensive and the more like luxurious and decadent the cake, the better. So like the more you don't, you know, you really don't want this situation to happen. Problem is then people, every time you bake someone a cake, they think that you've got an issue with them. But no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. That really hits home. Yeah. Well, it's the things we do, right? The things we do and the things we don't actually do. It's like the things we say and the things we don't actually say. You know, so often we have the choice to say the worst things, but we don't. So we hold it in or we have the choice to, to do the worst things to somebody, but we don't and we hold it in. And then how can we actually turn that into love? It's beautiful. It's beautiful, Kat. And, um, and so just because we wanted to also make sure that we touch a lot on, uh, on the nutritional aspect of your healing, because it is a Food Matters podcast, I just wanted to like ask you how over the years, how your diet has changed and how now as a yoga teacher and someone who's living a vibrant life in Vanuatu, what sort of foods, what's your like daily protocol and what sort of diet do you eat? Like I said before, I, I really feel nutrition is paramount. Like we are what we eat and food is medicine or it is poison. And it really is about every single thing that you put in your mouth will eventually affect you in some way. Like it's like it's mm -hmm. it comes back to karma, I believe. And so when I was diagnosed with MS, I, I did a special diet back. It was before Wall's protocol, but um you know, if, if it wasn't on my diet, I didn't need it. And I was really, really strict and it made a huge difference. And I had many doctors tell me, oh gosh, you're, you're wasting your time. Just take the drugs. But no, I've, I've stayed with, um, 
with the diet. And I spent many years really, you know, battling to, to, to feel well and be well. And I had to use Western medicine and holistic medicine. But now what mm-hmm. I do is I've, I've completely, I've been in remission for over oh, probably 10 years now. I haven't had an attack and I'm doing things that I never could. So I, and I, I really put that down to nutrition and to thoughts and to exercise and movement. But I mean, there's no way I can say, you know, you do these exact same things as I did and then you'll have the exact same result. But I think every single cho- moment we have a choice about what we put in our mouth. We have a moment about how we think about what's going on in our life. And we have to say, you know, what's actually going to make our lives in this world a better place? What's going to make me happier? What's going to make me healthier? And what's going to leave this world a better place And than when I first came into it? And it's making those choices that will make those differences. So your kids are watching you. Your friends are watching you. People around you are watching you. And what you do will respond, will, will influence them. You know, so it's a moment to moment doing things that are kind and loving and giving back. And then in return, you're a happier person. It all comes back to you. Mm, that's so beautiful. And in regards to, I mean, personally, I've gone through, I've done a lot of study on nutrition. I'm an expert in nutrition and I love healing people with nutrition. But at the end of the day, personally, I've become a lot more interested in um, emotional healing and emotional release and trauma therapy because we realize that a lot of times you may be able to treat somebody with nutrition and then afterwards you still see that there's the illness comes back or or the weight doesn't come off or there's still some form of a non disconnect and then we start having to look at the emotionals the emotional aspect of healing and what can what this person perhaps has experienced from zero to seven and what sort of traumas have they been sweeping under the carpet that they haven't actually dealt with and that are now showing up in their lives through illness so I personally feel as well like I have uh, yes I've been very very big on, on nutrition and cleaning our bodies out and and detoxing but I feel like the most important thing and hasn't really been addressed enough in healing is the emotional side the emotional aspect of healing which is doing detox therapies through with, with our thoughts and our, our stuck emotions and our traumas like I've been studying breath work I've been studying sound healing and different types of ways that we can release uh, stuck emotions through EFT tapping and emotional release therapy and and um, healing trauma because there's a lot of times where I feel like there's um, like let's say you have people dealing with PTSD that they haven't actually addressed the emotions of having dealt with trauma so in regards to dealing with trauma Kat you've gone through a lot of I would say disasters and, and trauma, how did you, um, what is your philosophy on, on dealing with trauma and how to treat it? Um, first of all, I, I'm really grateful to my father. So my dad was really, you know, if you had a sore ear, he'd say, come here and I'd chop it off for you. Like we learned to get over things really, really, really quickly. Like we didn't, we weren't ones to wallow in, in, in any type of pain, but for me, I think, you know, eventually you have to let things go. So you, I love the question, if not now, when? Like, if, is hanging on to this suffering helping me? Is hanging on to this pain in any way helping me? And it's like, well, no, it's not. So is it better to let it go? Yes. So if I'm not going to let go of it now, when will I? But if not, if it's not a good time to let go of it now, when will it be? Like, how long are you going to hang on to your pain and your trauma? So that's, first of all, I think the most important thing is, number one, is realizing you're carrying that trauma and you're recognizing it. And then recognizing that to, to hang on to these hurt things, somebody said something, somebody did something, something's happened. Like, you keep hanging on to this and you create this whole story around it. So we're great at creating bad news stories. And that's a big thing. So the event happened. It's not that it's good or it's bad. Just something happened. Somebody died. They died. That's just something that happened. It's the story we spin around it. So someone said Mm -hmm. something or did something. 
you know, is, is your, you know, your wife or your husband, you know, cheating on you and then taking your money? Is it a bad thing or is it a good thing? Well, it's, it, it really is how the story you spin on. It's like, oh, I can start over again. You know, oh, this is how, and it's also not just that, but it's, it's also about empathy. So when you're going through it, before you, before something bad happens to you, you can't really understand it. You're like, oh yeah, you know, someone tells you that they've just been diagnosed with cancer. You're like, oh, that's, it's really bad. But until it's actually happened to you, then you experience it because before then you, you feel bad for people, but you don't understand it. But then when it's happening to you, you're like, ah, this is how that person felt when they were telling me that story. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, can you get over it now? Or, <laughs> you know, like just do something about it. So it's like, you know, it's, it's realizing that how could you ever understand the suffering of, of others unless you experienced it yourself? And this is how millions and millions and millions of people feel when they go through this exact same thing, because you know what, you're not the first and you won't be the last. So it's, but it's, but hanging on to your pain, you actually transfer that pain to the people that love you. So I really believe that if I'm going to hang on to a painful emotion, other people are going to wear my pain. I'm not going to be emotionally available for my, my family or friends. I'm just going to go inside and I'm going to wallow and I'm going to be depressed and sad and I'm not going to be a better person for anybody else. So I ask myself, do I really want other people to wear my pain? Is that, is that fair? And, and when I was suicidal and I, was, I went through a, a time when I was 16 when I, was, I wasn't in a great place and I was suicidal and that's when I really realized that if I were to kill myself, I'd end my pain, but then I'd transfer my pain to the people around me. My father, my, my grandparents, my siblings, my friends would then be the ones to wear my pain. So I find that really helps. And to know that pain is impermanent, like look back over your life and how many times we've been through situations which were so horrible and painful but then, you know, 5, 10, 15 years later, they barely, you barely feel them anymore. You remember them. You don't forget them, but mm. they don't, you don't feel the same. So time heals all wounds. But how much time do we need? You know, can you look at it and go be your own best friend? You know, mm. would your best friend go, yeah, maybe you should suffer for a little bit longer. Like maybe you should be sad just, just for maybe another week or a month maybe like be really depressed for a little bit longer mm. like a friend wouldn't say that so what are you going to tell yourself are you going to tell yourself you know what whatever happened happened for a reason learn the le lessons from it and what's your best move going forward like do you want to be a happy loving kind person where you know you can make an, a change can you, and now that you've experienced this you can help others that have gone through this as well mm. like now that now you are a gift you are a gift to that person that who is suffering to to help them get over it and to move on and Aww. so that's what i really think with like things like ptsd and and trauma it's it's choosing to hang on to it or choosing to let it go and notice it that it's affecting you and notice that the way you're behaving is also affecting those that you love and going is that really what i want wow because usually it's not like, we're like, I love this person. I never want my child or my parents to have to, you know, suffer like this. It's like, well, then you have to stop suffering yourself. Wow. You've got to Beautiful find that happiness. Path. You've got to realize everything that's going right. And it's by stopping and going, what's going right in my life right now? What can I be happy wow. for? What can I be grateful for? And if I were to die right now, if I were to die today, what can I let go of? What thoughts? You know, what someone said, can I just let those go? And if you can, then do it. And then from now on, from the, this, this moment, you choose how you live your life. And you live it happily. You live it with joy. You live it with compassion. And you live it in a way that you think, how can I make this world a better place? I love it. So many nuggets of gold. Thank you, Kat. I, I really enjoyed this interview so much and I really love you as a person and you've been an inspiration for me for many years as a yoga teacher and working alongside of you, helping people heal. So I, I really admire your way of thinking. It's so fresh and it's so, I guess it's the way that the new world needs to really, it needs to hit home because we're all going through suffering and we're all, the way that we handle our suffering is the way that 
is 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 the way that our, we're going to be remembered and the way that we react to our suffering is the way that we're going to be remembered so thank you for your beautiful lessons and thank you for your time and i can't wait to see you and give you a big hug myself <laughs> yeah yeah i just like to like leave everyone with the statement you know never let a good disaster go to waste so every time anything in your life happens goes just ask yourself how can I not let this disaster go to waste and yes I can't wait to see you Laurentine and um, I just wish everyone to have a happy life and love and kindness and peace and know whatever you give out you get back thank you so much Kat bye bye love lots of love to you For everything that we've mentioned in today's episode, you can check out the show notes. There will be links and information there for you. And before I go, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to invest in yourself and be here for this podcast. If there's anybody that you can think of who could benefit from this information, please make sure to share it with them. We believe in the power of life-changing information, and it's especially powerful when it's shared from a trusted source. And finally, If you could leave us a comment or make sure to subscribe to the podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. It helps us continue to bring you this life-changing information and make sure that you get all future podcast updates sent to you. Have a beautiful day and thank you once again.